want to jump into this just for time's sake, right into this uh, week one uh, of this series that we're currently in right now that you heard Tanya, our host team lead, share about blind spots. And we're extending it two weeks, super awesome. And uh, Pastor Michelle, my wife, is going to begin to bring, she's going to bring the series finale home. It's going to be awesome. But uh, we are in week three. We are in week three, and I just want to give you a little bit of a quick recap. Week one, Joe brought an amazing message called relational deficits, talking about the areas in our, uh, our lives that have deficits concerning, in the midst of the context, of the concerning relationships specifically, and how oftentimes we don't even realize it, that we have a deficit when it comes to relationships in our life. You may feel like you're, you're you know, uh, an extrovert. You may feel like you have a lot of people that you know in your sphere, but how many re- Real relationships do you really have? That's what we talked about. And then week two, last week my message was entitled, Stay Off That Grill. Not girl. You should do that too. Stay Off That Grill. Talking about the seared conscience and how that, I believe, is the blind spot of all blind spots that we have and struggle with. And so really we're, you know, we're discovering these areas of our life that are blind spots to us. And some of them we don't even know know they exist. Some of them were aware of really are to our life. And so I'm excited to bring a uh, message week three. Last week was awesome because I'll share a little testimony for you. Uh, you know, there was this woman who came from CARP. It was her first time here. And uh, she came from CARP. She had a severe case of cellulitis in her right big toe. It was so full of fluid, so swollen, and she had like, it was wrapped in like a bandage and gauze. She came in, she had an IV in her arm, came into the service, first time here, during the service, had an encounter with Jesus, gave her heart to Jesus, which is awesome, for greatest miracle, right? And then, and then at the end, came up to receive prayer for healing, because she had heard that we believe uh, that Jesus heals here, like with, we pray for healing, we believe that, it happens, and um, we prayed for her that night. That night she goes home. This is the report that I got. Goes home. The all the fluid drained out of her toe, because the, the, the cool thing. Well, not the cool thing, but the the interesting thing. Before be, before all this, okay, the doctor had suggested we're probably gonna have to amputate your big toe. So that was the big deal. That's how bad it was. Okay, that's how bad the infection was. And so we prayed for her that night. All of the fluid drained out of her toe. The swelling went down. Saw the nurse the next day at the hospital. The nurse looked at her and said, "I don't know how this is possible. There's no hole where the fluid could have drained out. The fluid's all gone. The swelling's down." Saw the doctor the same week, and the doctor said, "We no longer need to amputate your toe." Isn't that awesome? So she has she has an encounter with Jesus, and then she gets healed. That's the whole package right there. That's why Jesus came. It wasn't just to save your soul. It was also to heal your, heal your body as well. So week three, we're jumping into this. Go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. I'm going to give you a lot today. So take notes. If you have, a, if you have an iPhone or whatever, notepad, uh, whatever, whatever school you belong, belong to, whether the old school, the new school, doesn't matter. Take notes any way you can. Genesis 3, verse 1. 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, speaking of Satan was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Context for this passage, you know, sin had not come into the world yet. Adam and Eve are living in perfect harmony with God. And they're, they're enjoying life, um, they're, they're enjoying life with God, they're enjoying his creation, and, uh, and there's a serpent, Satan, pictured as Satan, in, this, co- in this, this story that comes to tempt Adam and Eve. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Verse 2, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. I was thinking about that one verse. You can't eat it, and you can't touch it. It's like the people who justify, well, I didn't inhale. I didn't inhale, so it's okay. You know, he said, you can't get near it, you can't touch it, and you can't eat it. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you inhaled or not. If you touch this thing, you're you're, you're dead. You're dead meat, okay. Anyways, verse uh, verse, verse 4. Or, sorry, yeah, yeah, verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Verse 5. For God knows that in that day or in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, key phrase right here, and a tree 
desirable, write that word down in your notes, desirable, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Verse 7, and the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord of God walking in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman, I love it, like he just goes and deflects it, you know, the woman, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, if you're taking notes, write this down on your notes, the damage of desire. That's my message title for you today, the damage of of desire. My subtitle called in for questioning. How many know that desire is a good thing? Desire is a good thing. Good things misguided can become bad things. Good things misguided or misdirected can become damaging things to our life. There are good desires and there are bad desires. In this context, you, you see Eve had this desire to know God better, right? I mean, perfection was all around her. Sin had not even come into the camp yet. She had no context or paradigm for evil. All she knew was good. That's why God said, don't touch or eat off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I want you to remain conscious or, co or have a consciousness of good only. I don't want you to have a consciousness of evil. Don't touch that tree. If you touch it or you eat it, you're going to die. It's going to produce death in you. And the enemy comes around and plays with the pure desire of Eve to know God more and begins to challenge the word of God that had been spoken to Adam and Eve, saying, you may eat off every tree but this one tree. But this one tree. And, you know, I, I just thinking about the fact that a good desire, a pure desire, if it's misguided, or if it's led the wrong way, can become damaging desire to our life. And so this whole passage, the reason why I called it, called in for questioning, is this, this whole entire passage, I believe, is like the greatest lesson for counseling somebody. It's like a, a lesson of counseling, counseling 101. It, it, God is questioning Adam and Eve now to help them along a journey now to deal with the very thing that was just caused, which, which really was death to their life. Dealing with that, God brought them along a journey through questioning process to help the beginning of their restoration. Now I'm going to show you, and really this is a picture of the gospel being preached before the gospel ever was preached by Jesus himself. This is a picture of it for you but as I go into this I was thinking about a story about how you know in grade seven I got my I'm a drummer I'm a musician and I and grade seven I got my first before I got my whole drum set I got a hi-hat and a snare drum you know what a hi-hat is it's the little cymbals you play over here the snare drum is the, the the main drum you hit right here that some of you might get you know feel like it's too loud on Sundays sometimes but anyways I remember I got in grade seven a hi-hat and a, and a snare drum and I, I became passionate about learning the drums. I had this desire. I wanted to be a good drummer, and I loved music. I desired music, and so I, you know, how I learned is funny because uh, I remember, you know, in my basement, I didn't have a bass drum yet. I didn't have a full set, so I had to, I had to navigate that. And so I would use the wall. I would hit the wall, the side of my foot, and I'd use the wall as a bass drum. And I'd practice to Nirvana, Nir, Nirvana songs and Smashing Pumpkins songs. So that's a little bit of a throwback for you. Practice to Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins. It was a great way to practice because they weren't very talented. So I, I actually would, <laughs> I'm just joking, but not really. But anyways, I'd practice and I'd hit the, the wall with my foot. And it was an awesome way. And a friend of mine, he'd come over to my house with his acoustic guitar. And we practiced Nirvana songs, you know. And it was awesome. And I learned that way. And I, this desire began to grow. Like I said, how many know desire misguided, though, can cause damage? And so, you know, I, I decided that year to change because in grade six, I, I was in, I, I played the trumpet. 
And the trumpet wasn't really the cool thing to play. Everyone wanted to play the drums, right? The drum was like it was the cool thing to play in middle school. Everyone's going through an identity crisis in middle school. When you're in junior high, you're all figuring out who you are. You're all going through identity crisis. So, you know, I was like, you know, and I had a passion genuinely. So I changed from trumpet to drums in grade 7. And this new teacher comes along my path, this music teacher. You know, and uh, I had this, like, crush on my music teacher. I'm just throwing it out there. I had this crush on her. And, uh, but we had this love-hate relationship because I had this crush on her, but she did not like me. And uh, most of the time, I did not like her, but I still had this weird crush on her. I, I can't explain how that works, but I guess, whatever. Anyway, so, and obviously, she's like, like, obviously, I'm like grade seven, okay? So, um, and so I had this issue where I did not like following along the music sheets, playing the drums with the band, like the band was playing, and I would do my own thing. I mean, here I am practicing the Nirvana song, Smashing Pumpkins song in my basement, and then I get to school, and I'm like following these weird music sheets, these weird songs that I feel like just need a little spice. And so I'm like doing my own thing, and frequently my music teacher, who I had a crush on, who didn't like me, and I didn't like her most of the time, would stop the class and confront me but on the fact that I wasn't either listening or paying attention, like classic Classic issue in my, all my educational years. I wasn't listening and paying attention. You know, I, I was the guy, what, what did he say? What did he, in class, what, what, what did they just say? What, test, what? You know, I was that guy. It was completely changed when I encountered Jesus. Now all of a sudden, it, everything changed for me. But anyways, I, I, I had this, um, this, this, this issue, and so I get called out, and then she'd get mad at me in class. And she'd be like, Sean, what are you doing? And she's like, wipe that scowl off your face. And I'm like, what scowl? I'm like, born this way. What are you talking about? Wipe it off. You got to wipe it off. I'm like, I didn't, was, Botox didn't exist back then. So I'm thinking, I, I, and she'd like expose my scowl to the whole class. And then I get really mad at her. And I'm like, okay, you just messed with the wrong person, you know. And, and I get really mad at her. And I would continue doing the opposite thing. And that desire, you know, it created damage, damage, bad relationship, bad things happened as a result of that. And then moving into high school, that desire really grew. Really good, and to the place where all I thought about was music and art all throughout high school. I didn't care about anything else. I was totally, like, didn't, did not care. Um, you know, my, I remember my English teacher told me, you're never going to amount to anything, Sean. Like, who, what kind of teachers say that kind of stuff over their students, you know? It's like, I, I feel like showing him, yeah, what's up now? You know, anyways. But anyways, um, I, 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 um, I, I, going through high school, I remember being in this marketing class, and, um, you know, this was a frequent thing. Once again, my desire, misguided, got me in trouble. And I, I'd be in class, and I'd kind of go into a daze, go into a trance before I even knew what a trance was. And I just kind of like, I just start drumming on the table. And uh, frequently, again, like, I'd, the class would stop, and I'd either have to go sit in the hallway, like, which I don't really know if that's even a good disciplinary action to do. Go sit in the hallway. Like, I mean, what does that do? I'm like, sweet. I don't have to be in class. Like, why? I don't think people realize the, the I don't know if, how it is now, but, um, I remember going to the principal's office. I remember going in the hallway and not being, just being distracted because all I cared about was those things. But once again, my desire, misguided in the wrong context, got me into trouble. And like a lot of us, how many, how many in this room have experienced some of that? How many experienced some of the, their desires getting out of control? Because desire is okay, but when it's misguided and it gets out of control, it can get you into trouble and cause damage in our life. And, but how many know that God is a restorative God? God can restore a cool, really cool story is like years and years later. So when I'm, I eight, I'm 18 years old, I have this encounter with Jesus, changes my life. Every, the course of my life entirely changes. And so now I'm, you know, I begin to travel. I begin to move to the U.S. I begin to travel around the world. And, and, and God begins to open up all these doors for me. And, and so I'm, I'm in this like full-time, you know, traveling, speaking, you know, ministry vocation. I don't even know how I got here. And then one day in 2007, I get this invitation to come speak at this church in New York. And uh, I'm looking at the, the like, invitation, and I'm like, man, that's, that's weird. That, that name sounds really familiar. And guess who it was? It was my music teacher from grade 7. I'm like, are you kidding me? So she had gotten married to a supply teacher that I'd also had in, in junior high. And the story was that she had an encounter with Jesus later on. After he, I guess, she, before she got married to this guy who knew Jesus, she has this encounter. She is totally transformed. They become pastors of a church in New York. I think in the slash irony of this scenario is massive right now, you know. So I go, I accept the invitation. It's, a, it's an invitation to speak at a conference at their church. And so, I, and it's back when, when, you know, when I was hosted, when I stayed in people's homes, uh, I was hosted in their home. And, like, the irony of it, like, I remember the first night, 
Michelle and I were sleeping in their bed. I'm, I'm like thinking, I'm in my music teacher's bed right now. Like from grade seven that did not, that we, I, we didn't have this like this good relationship. And now I'm in her bed speaking at our church. I didn't even want to go there from the past. I didn't want to even, I, I didn't want to bring up the past. Uh, there's too many things that happened I didn't want to bring up. But it's kind of like acting like, yeah, yeah, we're all cool. Grade seven music teacher, yeah, you know, what's up? But really I had a lot of like, uh, awkward, there was a lot of irony and awkwardness in the whole situation. But it was awesome and God moved at their church. But isn't that awesome how God can take the, the damage of unguided, misguided, misdirected desire and clean it up in a way just like that. I mean, just so, so cool. So cool. The reality of it is that we were all created, though, for desire. We were all created to, to desire things that were good for us. We were all created for pleasure. Your design, okay, your design as a, hum as a human being, as a spiritual being, your, your design is designed around experiencing pleasure. That's why we get into all kinds of crazy things. Because we're designed for it. We're designed to experience pleasure. You know, some of us find pleasure in food. We find you know, pleasure in our careers. We find pleasure in, you know, uh, uh, relationships. We find uh, pleasure in clothes, material possessions. These are all good things. These are all really good things. But these things worshipped or these things out of control can cause great damage to your life. And then God has to bring us through a series of, of questioning, a series of, or a process to help change our situation and bring us into restoration. And, uh, you know, I, I see so many people, things start off good, they, they desire, you know, uh, they desire to do things for God, and then all of a sudden money get, becomes their, their greatest desire, and then they get, they get off track. You know, the Bible says money is the root, the love of money, not money, the love of money. Money's good, you should desire it. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money itself, money is really good. Money worshipped is not good in your life. Money as God in your life is not good. Clothes, people, all those things you can find your identity in. When you find your identity in something other than God who created you, that's when the damage begins to happen in your life. Your desires shift from desiring your creator, God himself who created you with a purpose, to all of a sudden all these things. That's when the damage begins to happen. The word Eden even in and of itself, in the Hebrew means pleasure. Adam and Eve were created in the garden. They were put in the, this garden, this garden uh, called Eden, and they were, they were put in this place. And that, that literally means they were literally put in a 24-hour, whatever the hour or timeline was back then, an experience of 24-hour-a-day pleasure with God. They were naked, free, frolicking, <laughs> picture this now, frolicking, naked in the wind, dancing. Like, no, no knowledge that they're even naked. What naked is? What is naked? This is just what we are. I mean, there was nothing hindering relationship. I mean, it's awesome. We're naked, Adam. We're naked together. We're, you know, God's here. We're all hanging out, having a good time, you know, on our back porch doing whatever we do. You know, whatever God did back then, playing golf maybe. I don't think he played golf. Probably, probably played volleyball or something or <laughs> work, working out of the gym. or I don't know. But, but anyways, they had a good time together. And, you know, the reality of it is God wants to give us the desires of our heart. Let's look at Psalms 37.4 really quick. Psalms 37 verse 4, it says, I love this passage, it says, or this verse, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of whose heart? Your heart. Interesting, we think, oh, they want what God wants, they want God's, and that's awesome. But there's a, a place in your relationship with God where your heart and his heart align so much so that God can begin to give you the desires of your heart. This word for delight in the Hebrew is an interesting word, and it actually means to have a softened heart, a pliable heart. This is what it means to delight yourself in God. When you, when you can have a softened heart towards the things that God cares about, all of a sudden your heart and his, his heart connect and collide and become one, become into alignment. And as a result then, what ends up happening is his desires become your desires. And when you ask of him out of that place of alignment, he begins to give you all that you ask for. I'm not saying, you know, ask God for a Rolls Royce and you're saying, well, God wants me to have a Rolls Royce. That's God's heart for me. I'm not saying that he may want you to have a Rolls Royce for some odd reason. What I'm saying is that when you open up your heart, you surrender to God, your desires align. And all of a sudden now God can begin to teach you, hey, I want to I care about what you care about because it's actually in my heart. I really care about it and I'm going to begin to give it to you. Because when it says here, and he shall give you the desires, that word for desires literally means the petitions and the requests that you bring to God, God will give you. Isn't that awesome? 
So God cares about desire. God wants to give you the desires of your heart, but you have to have a softened heart towards the things that his, soft, his heart are softened towards in your life. So desire is good. God wants to give you desire, but once again, desire misguided is not. And this is what happened to Eve. Go back to Genesis 3, verse 6. Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable, it was beautiful. That word for desirable here actually means to she lusted after it. She, she coveted after it. All of a sudden, because God said, okay, listen, you guys can eat off any tree you want, but there's one tree. There's always a butt in the room. There's always a butt. This was a big butt. This was a massive butt. And it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? And, and God said, listen, you can eat all that, but you can't, you can't do this. You touch it, you're going to die. I don't care if you inhale. I don't care if you exhale. You touch it, you're dead. Okay? And so, you know, th this was like this, this one thing in the midst of this pleasurable uh, experience that she was having all the time. The one thing that she could not touch. And she, she began to lust after it. Because, you know, when you say you can't do something, it's like you say to your child, don't put your hand in the light socket. What do they do next? It's like, you just told me I can't do it, so I'm going to start doing it. So the enemy uses that moment and begins to tempt her. Now, like, this is what I want to say to you. The desire in this moment was absolutely pure. You know what her desire was? The desire was to be more like God, to, to have a better relationship with God. That's what, that, was, that was her desire. Genuinely, in her heart, she God more and more. And the fact that there was this one limitation intrigued her a little bit it, it sparked her interest it provoked her and the enemy began to play on her holy desire see you could have a holy desire you could have a pure motive but you can do a stupid thing and you you can't say to somebody well hey my heart was pure you know i i i, I, I did this bad thing i i kissed this girl even though i'm married i kissed this girl but my heart was pure and so no god doesn't care in that moment about your pure heart you did a stupid thing there's going to be a consequence God's looking now at the reality of what you've done. You did not obey me. You did not listen. I don't care in that moment. Your heart was pure because she wanted to be more like God. She did genuinely. That's all she knew. She only had a paradigm for good in that moment. She didn't know evil yet. So the enemy comes, serpent comes, begins to use that pure desire against her. And say, well, did God really say? I mean, because you see, I, I, I know you really want to know God more. And so, so this is what the, the, the serpent said to, to Eve. See, God knows that if you eat off this tree, you'll, you'll kind of be more like him. Because now all of a sudden you'll have knowledge of good and evil like he does. You'll, you'll be able to see like he does. You'll be able to perceive like he does. Right now you can only see good. But you see, God sees evil too. I mean, I'm evil. The serpent's evil. And so God knows both ends. You don't know both ends yet. So the enemy begins to play on her her pure desire and all of a sudden her attention shifts from what God had said to this little serpent which is often what we do right it's like we go from like this this awesome like we love God all of a sudden we pay attention to the small things the gross things in life the serpent that's all of a sudden tempting me the, the issue wasn't that she was being tempted because temptation will happen to you temptation will happen to you you know that you are not um you will never be free from temptation in your life. You may not have temptation in certain areas of your life, but you will never be free of temptation in your life. It's part of the journey. It's just it happens. The enemy's always trying to take you out by the legs. Always. Temptation in and of itself isn't the issue. It's when you begin to interact with temptation. Eve was fine until she turned her attention to begin to converse with the serpent. Because listen, verse, verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Right before this, she's actually having a conversation with the serpent. She's having a conversation. She's interacting. It's kind of like what we begin to do. You know, that little voice says, you, you're never going to do it. You're never going to make it. You're always going to fail. You're always going to have these issues. You're always going to have this addiction. And you begin to say, yeah, you're right. You begin to converse with that voice. You begin to say, yeah, you're right. You know, I'm always going to fail. Like, you know, my husband's never going to love me. My wife's never going to love me. My kid's never going to love me. The friends that I have are never going to really be real with me. All, and you begin to interact with all those voices in your life. And all of a sudden, you become the result of those voices in your life. Those voices begin to produce death in your life. How many know death smells like something? Death has a rotten smell. You get around people, you can feel it. You smell it. It's something you're, you've been listening to those voices. This is what began to happen to Eve. And, and I want you to write this down. I think it's a good thing to write down. I think something, something good to stick with your soul as you leave today. It says here, or this is what I wrote. Um, we begin to experience spiritual, mental, 
and emotional damage when a pure desire is overtaken by an impure motive or reasoning. This is what happened to Eve. Pure desire to know God. And then he played on that. Said, hey, you can know God better. Know good and evil. And all of a sudden, her motive shifted. Her reasoning shifted. She went from wanting to trust God and doing and knowing God his way to all of a sudden wanting to know God in a way that was opposed to what God had said to Adam and Eve. You, you following me? Her motive shifted. Her process shifted. The, her path shifted. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to achieve more knowledge of God my own way. I'm going to open my own door. How many know that if you open your own door, somebody else can close it? But when God opens a door, nobody can close it. It's your door. You own it, man. It's your door. You got the key. Nobody can close it. But if you push your own door open, what ends up happening through through some bad situation or circumstance, somebody will come along and close that door. Because God never opened it anyways. You went through that door. That's what happened to eat. Let's go to James 1 really quick. James 1 verse 14 says, out of this is out of the voice translation. This is a picture, okay, of exactly what happened to Eve in this moment. When a person is carried away with desire, remember desire is not bad, but when they're carried away, controlled, ruled, misguided desire. When a person is carried away with desire, lured by lust, and when desire becomes the focus, see, it, when that desire, when that moment becomes the focus, when that, what that means is you begin to worship. You begin to make that the priority. That becomes first God and his wisdom and what he has spoken, his plan, purpose, redemption, destiny over your life becomes secondary. When the desire becomes the focus, it takes control. And then it gives birth to sin. And when sin becomes fully grown, it produces death. So watch this. Keep that up on the screen for a second. Let's just use this passage right now to remind us of what happened to Eve. Eve is carried away with desire. All of a sudden, her pure desire gets a little bit, you know, it, it mixed up. She begins, she gets tempted. She's carried away now with this unholy desire to go after the very thing God said, don't touch, don't eat. Then she's lured in by the lust. The Bible says in Genesis 6, it was pleasant to the eyes. Remember that? That, that, that her eyes caught that fig or the, the blackberry. That's what it was, blackberry. Black, it wasn't an apple. It was, a, it was, or it probably was a fig, but I think it was a blackberry because blackberries is just, a, I don't know why they exist. But anyway, so like, it, you know, like this blackberry is there and, 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 and she, her eyes caught the attention of this blackberry and, and it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust. There was a lust that began to happen. A lust that began to happen. And then that desire for that thing on that tree, it became the focus because she's interacting with this temptation now. It became the focus and then it took control and she didn't even know why. I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm like, and she's like reaching out. I can't even control it. She just can't handle it. She has to have it now. How many have to, has to have it now people do we have in the room? You got to have it now. You got to have it now. Dangerous. Dangerous. She's got to have it now. She can't control herself anymore. You know, it's like, I got to get married. <laughs> I can't control my enemies. So, so when sin, and, and, and then it gives birth to sin. It gives birth to sin. And then listen, when sin becomes fully grown, it produces death. The result of her action created a, a, a system of birth where everybody born after Adam and Eve was born into a spiritual prison, born into sin. Born into a deathly state. Their spirit was not alive. Born in darkness. But thank God Jesus came. That's why Jesus is called the second Adam. It's called the second Adam. To redeem us. To reconcile us back to God. To reconcile us literally back to the way it was in the garden. Where nothing separated us from God. No clothes. No fig leaf. Nothing. We, there was like relationship again. That's the good news of the gospel, you guys. You with me? So why this whole thing about called in for questioning? Because I think that this passage really gives us a picture of the questions that God brings us through to help us deal with the damage of desire, misguided desire. So I want to give you three quick points. And I want to do two things for you. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to paint a picture for you. And I'm going to outline for you three questions that God asks us 
in the process of counseling us through a process into restoration, okay? You may feel like you're in a mess right now. You're struggling with something. This will help you, okay? For those of you who feel like, hey, I'm not struggling with anything. I'm good. I'm going. I'm going for my destiny. I'm going for my purpose. It's all good in the hood. Nothing's wrong with my life, which probably isn't really true. And if you believe that, you're probably just, you know, you're not thinking properly. You have a blind spot, right? Uh, that's why we're doing blind spots. The whole series is called Blind Spots, you know? You don't know you often have a blind spot until somebody tells you you have a blind spot. And even then, you have a hard time acknowledging you have a blind spot, right? Until you're in the accident. You're like, somebody help me. We tried to. We didn't listen. But we'll help you anyways because God loves you. <laughs> anyways. <laughs> Pastoring 101. Anyways. Um, so, so anyways, so, um, you know, and the second thing I want to do is those that are on that journey, you know, I believe that these are questions that God will continually ask us through our journey to help us achieve our purpose and destiny. This is going to help you guys. I really believe that. So open up your heart. Say, God, mess me up today. The next 15 minutes, mess me up. Number one, first question God will ask us is where are you? And this speaks of our position. This speaks of our position. You know, you, the first, the first stage to receiving help in any area is locating where you currently are. If you're driving to someone's house, okay, you're driving to someone's house and you get lost. And you call the person that, you're, that, that owns the house you're driving to. You say, I am lost. What's the first question they're going to ask you? Where are you? Well, give me a reference point to start from. I can't help you. I can't come into you. I can't come in to help to, to bring you to the first stage of un un getting lost, not like getting unlost, if you don't give me a reference point for where you currently are. What's your location? Where are you? And, you, and you, if you say, well, I don't know where I am, well, then you're not going to get any help. If you can't acknowledge your current state, your current location in life, and you can't acknowledge where you stand right now, you're not going to be able to be helped in life. It's like the person with the addiction that, that says, I don't have an addiction. Well, the first step is acknowledging you have an addiction. Acknowledging your position, your location. What's your position? State it. Do you see a sign? Do you see a yellow car? Do you see a big restaurant? Do you see a certain street sign? What's, what's the reference point that you need to tell me so I can help you reach your destination? You see, so I want to go to this passage first in Genesis 3, and I want to start it in uh, verse 7. So after they ate this uh, blackberry, and the eyes of both of them were opened, okay? So all of a sudden now they're aware. They made a big mistake. Their eyes are open, and they were naked. First step of death, okay? And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering, which is very important we understand this because the first thing that we do, all of us, we make a mistake, the first thing we do is we want to hide that mistake. We want to hide the shame. We want to hide the shame and the condemnation that mistake brings. So we try to do our own penance, try to figure out, okay, by my works, I'm going to make myself feel better. So I'm going to grab a fig leaf, okay? It was actually a blackberry leaf, if that even exists. But I have a, blackberry, a blackberry leaf, and I'm going to sew it together, and I'm going to cover my nakedness. Because that's, hey, like, but the, it's interesting because the Bible is very clear. We're not saved by our works, right? You can be good all you want. That doesn't get you into heaven. That doesn't get you to know God. You can be good all you want. It's not about what you do. It's about what he did. And so Adam and Eve trying to figure out a way, hey, what can I do to medicate this issue? Grab a fig leaf. Quickly, hide myself. Hide my nakedness, okay? Then verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves, and they hide themselves. And next thing we often do is we hide ourselves, right? Isolate ourselves. I had a fight with my wife on the way in here, or a fight with my kids, or I spanked my kids in the parking lot, or I yelled at my neighbor before I came, or I had a fight with my coworker. Now, how can I worship God? How can I come to a church and be loved by God? And so we hide ourselves. I'm not going to church today. I had a bad night last night, so how can I get up in the morning and act like everything's okay? People go through that all the time. Try to hide. They hide. They hide themselves from God. But the thing is, you can't hide yourselves from God. God's watching every move. He knows everything. He's not even surprised by your actions. So then it continues on. They hid themselves. Verse 9. I love this. It says this. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? What's your location? God was not actually wondering where Adam was. God never asks you a question he doesn't already know the answer to. The reason why he asks you a question is because he wants you to hear your own answer. So in that moment, you are held accountable to the acknowledgement of stage one of restoration. Or, or stage one of moving to the next step in life. 
moving into your purpose, acknowledging, hey, this is my location. Yeah, I don't know why I'm really here, actually. Yeah, that's a good question, God. Why am I here? Where am I? Like, where am I? Well, I am in a bad place right now. You see, because all of us want this quick fix thing, right? But the greatest counselors will always counsel you through a series of questions. So how did that make you feel? I remember this one psychologist I used to see back in the day. I remember, so, and it was this like, like soft voice. So how did that make you feel? It was very calming. And you just like want to d- divulge everything, you know. How did that make you feel? It had this like beautiful tone to it. How did that make you feel? I just remember it over and over again. Oh, I feel so good by even just that question that you asked me. Here you go. That, that made me feel like this. And, and I, in the, the process of responding to the question, I began to realize, hey, man, I actually know a lot more than I thought I did. I know a lot more of the reason why I am here or where I really am than I thought I did. The answer was already on the inside of me. You see, the beautiful thing about God is once you're in contact with God, you have wisdom already on the inside of you. And the, most of the time, the process is simply just mining out what you already have. I mean, Ephesians is very, you know, very, very clear. Ephesians 1 says you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Newsflash, you've got it all. You just need a process to begin to mine out what you really have in your life. You can't say, Holy Spirit, come. He's already here. If you, if, if you, Romans 8, 8 verse 14 says that he's in you. 8 verse 11 says he's in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living within you now. If you're a believer in Jesus, you've come into contact with him, he's in you now. So it's just a matter of becoming aware of what you already have on the inside of you. I ask for wisdom. The Bible says, ask for wisdom, believe you received it. So, hey, God, it's already there. I asked for it one time. I got to get it. Now it's a process of mining it out. I got this gold mine on the inside of me, and I got to go in, and I got to mine it out. It can take five years to mine out that one big gold nugget that I'm looking for. But if it takes five years, it takes five years. But the wisdom of God's inside of me. And so God is counseling and bringing them through a process of questioning to help them along a journey of going to stage one and moving forward. And I was thinking about this, and, you know, how many times I've been called into questioning. When I, uh, I used to have long dreadlocks for, for seven years, and I was in traveling full-time ministry, and uh, nobody thought I was a Christian everywhere I went. And, um, and, and I literally have these, que- these, like, moments of questioning in customs offices all the time. Planes would be held on the runway for me. I mean, it was annoying. I remember the first time I went, ever went to Israel, I was escorted to a plane with ten police officers. I sat in a back room while they strip searched me. This guy by us too in this like soundproof room, no windows, poking around every little crevice possible, strip searching me. You know, and then going through a process of watching them dump all of my luggage, not like gently, throwing it, shaking it out onto the floor and literally piecing it all over the floor and taking out every little thing and questioning me. Why are you going to Israel? What are you doing? You know, just crazy. That happened to me all the time. All the time. And uh, I remember it just like over the years, like I, I at first I really built, I had an anxiety about going to the, the border because, you know, it's like it's like a power trip, right? You go to the border and like, oh, they're going to ask you a question. They're going to see a, a, resp- a weird response. And now it was just because I was nervous because I was always being questioned, not because I had anything to hide. It's like I actually just don't like being questioned so much and you're doing it in a way that's now intimidating and awkward. Now I'm going to say the wrong thing, say too much, now you're going to ask more questions and I'll get in trouble. You know what I mean? I didn't even do anything wrong in the first place. Like, what's wrong with this scenario? But then something shifted after that that. Me being escorted to the plane with 10 police officers in Israel, being the last person on the biggest flight I've ever been on in my life, and everybody watching me come in, looking like the guy that probably did something wrong. Think about it. You know, I'm the last person, dreadlocks. I'm the last guy. They're waiting for me. <laughs> 10 police officers. I was with other, other, some other guys, too, that were going on different flights. And so I come in. I mean, it's not a very good scenario to, to like, you know, go, I hey, am coming on the plane, guys. Ready? You know, everybody's looking at me. Everyone's like, you know, like, and, and you know, I, I'm there. To, I'm going to Israel to do some ministry, you know, and anyways, but I remember that experience brought this new level of faith. Now when I go to the, now when I go to airports, I'm like praying way beforehand. And I don't have those scenarios and thank God I haven't. Maybe it's because I cut my hair or something, but anyways, who knows? Who knows? Let me ask you a few questions. A few questions to help you in this process. We're still on point one. I want to ask you this question. Where are you in life? Are you where you thought you were going to be? Are you where you hoped you would be at this point in your life? Where are you? What's your location? Because if you can't acknowledge your current state, you'll never move into the next thing in your life. Where do you want to be right now? Is this where you want to be? Where are you in life? 
Where are you in the context of creating healthy family dynamics? Where are you in your career? You know, maybe you had a bad business deal. You stepped out in faith. You like all your faith, all your eggs in that one basket, and you made a bad mistake and you failed and now you're hiding yourself and you kind of made this thing and you're hiding yourself now from your destiny your purpose because you're afraid of having that same failure again kind of like Adam and Eve did they begin to hide themselves they felt unworthy unloved unaccepted I can't do this anymore I, I made a big mistake I didn't listen maybe that was you in your career now you're at a place right now in your career that you don't really want to be where are you in your career where are you in your thoughts towards yourself that's a big one are you insecure do you're battling jealousy bitterness unforgiveness hatred where how do you think towards your, yourself and often how you think about yourself is determined by the issues in your heart We don't realize this, but if our heart is, is unhealthy, then that heart, that, that, that unhealthy heart will project bad thoughts to your mind and will tell you things that aren't true about yourself. And you begin to believe them and interact with them like Eve did, it will produce death in your life. Where are you breaking your bad, where are you at with breaking your bad habits, your, the New Year's resolution that you've made 10 times in the last 10 years? Where are you with breaking your bad habits? Habits, where are you standing concerning life issues? What do you believe about certain life issues? Do you know where you stand? Where are you in your relationships? Or the my favorite one, where are you in relation to God? It's really a big question, really the, the first big question that I believe, like really God asked mankind, where are you? He knew where he was, he knew. But he wanted, Adam, he wanted Adam and Eve to begin the process. Okay, you know what, you made a big mistake, I know this, I have a plan. And, and I, how do I know this? Because... The Bible is very clear in Revelation, the book of Revelation. There's a verse that says, it's a powerful verse, it says, the Lamb of God, speaking of Jesus, had sacrificed himself, died before the foundation of the earth or the world even began. Which means it already happened spiritually. So there was already a plan of redemption even before mankind was created. God knew what man would choose. Because God wanted to give man a free thoughts here. But God wanted us to... Because love is something you learn in life. It's something you get and receive from God, but you learn to manifest throughout your life, around the context of your life. And so God wanted mankind to learn to love Him, to learn to love others, and go through a process by freedom of choice. And I, I remember this, this, this scenario of my life, and I'm moving on here. I'm going to go a little over time today, and I apologize. But I, I remember this scenario of my life where, it was a bad scenario. I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but I remember, you know, in grade nine, in grade nine, one of the times where, because I was, I was processing this, this message, and I was thinking, God, like, I, I know that, like, you've done this in my life, and, and you've stopped some things that could have been really dangerous for me future, and I remember in grade nine getting into some trouble, and I remember, uh, uh, you know, being in this mall, and I was in this pretty big mall, and, uh, and all of a sudden, next thing I know, I have this police officer behind me putting my hand in handcuffs and walking me back to this back room. And I remember thinking in my mind, like, this is not a good scenario, you know. And thinking in my mind, this is kind of embarrassing, all these people watching me go back in this back room with handcuffs on. And, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't like this scenario, but I remember thinking in my, because I was called in for questioning at this point, and it was like a two-hour a two like, questioning, I mean, all kinds of questions, and I had to like empty everything out. They were searching everything, asking me some of the weirdest questions ever. I remember being in this process and, and uh, thinking in my mind, like, like, how did I get here? Like, how did I get into this scenario? Like, where am I? Like, how did I get into this moment? And not really and not in that moment realizing all the steps, all the things that I had done leading up to that moment, not even realizing, like, like, with, with, like, there's a blind spot in my life. And I, I, didn't, I didn't have Jesus as the center of my focus in this time of my life. I didn't have him in my life this way. And so I, I didn't really know how to navigate the next step. But I knew that, hey, I knew the first step to change in my life would be acknowledging that I'm not supposed to be here where I am. I'm not supposed to be here. So I'm going to continue this story on. But I, I want to give you the, the, my second point now for the sake of time. First point, question God asks us, where are you? Second point is who told you? Who told you? Let's go to Genesis 3, verse 10 and 11. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, listen to this, who told you that you were naked? Once again, God knew the serpent told. God knew the serpent had been speaking to Adam and Eve. God knew that, they, that, that Adam and Eve at that point were listening to the wrong voices in their life. How many at times have listened to the wrong voices in their life? Right? 
I, 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 you know, I've had many times when, uh, you know, I'm so thankful for, you know, this is, this is after, this is like, you know, AD for me, like after my old man died and I became a new creation. This is like not my BC days before Christ. This is after God began to surround me with some amazing mentors. And I, I saved myself from a lot of failure, potential failure and mistakes because I had good voices in my life. But there was a time in my life where I had some really bad voices in my life. And, and thinking about where I ended up at certain points in my life, even before I met Jesus, thinking about, like, who told me that I had to do this? And I remember thinking, in this office, being called into questioning by this police officer, I remember thinking in my mind, okay, thinking in my mind, like, who told me that I had to do all of what I was doing to get what I wanted to get in life? Like, who, what did I start believing that? What, who are the voices in my life? Or what was that voice that shattered in my mind that began to direct me and guide me the wrong way? Because my desire was for something specific, but then it got misguided, carried away, turned on the wrong thing, and all of a sudden now I'm living the damage of desire gone bad. Who told me? Who told me? Maybe, maybe you're at a place right now, you don't know why you're in the place you're at, but the next step for healing and restoration is acknowledging, how did you get here? What voice did you listen to? What counsel did you listen to? Or what counsel did you not listen to? Who told you that you are a failure? Who told you that you need to live uh, at the, the bottom of the totem pole your whole life? And who told you you're never going to succeed in life? Who, who told you you're always going to be insecure and you're always going to struggle with addiction? Who told you all those different things? Who told you? Who told you that you were worthless? Who told you that you'll never amount to anything? Who told you that you're not loved? Who told you? What voices have you listened to? And I was thinking about this, how oftentimes, like, you know, I've said this, uh, you know, lots of times over and over again. Like, I, I don't have much of a problem when somebody writes a bad blog about me or somebody says something bad about me that I don't even know. I have no context for them. I have no relationship with them. Um, you know, and there's been times, lots of times when that's happened. You know, I remember my first time going to Ireland and ministering in Ireland. I remember greeting the, one of the churches. I was doing a tour in Ireland. And one of the churches I was speaking at was, was this church where revival was breaking out. It was awesome. I mean, it was being broadcast around the world. And and I remember it was in Belfast, and this pastor shakes my hand. I, I was in the car driving to his church, and this is the way he transitioned me into this area. He said, by the way, I'm just letting you know, before you came here, there was a DVD sent around to all the major influential churches in this area, and it had you on it and a bunch of your friends saying that you were false teachers and false prophets and not to come to the meetings, to be warned. I remember thinking in my mind, I'm like, well, oh, that's kind of cool that somebody would like take all that time and edit a DVD, find clips online, edit a DVD, probably take out specific words and, and manipulate it to, to, you know, to make us look like false teachers or whatever. That's kind of cool that he took some time. But at the same time, you know, I don't even really care because I have no relationship with this person. And it's, I, I don't think it's going to affect anything that I'm doing here anyways. Because if you're, if you're at a place where you're listening to the wrong voices or listening to voices like that, you're not in a good place anyways. Not in a good place anyways. And so I kind of brushed it off. But then I was thinking about it. But the times when it is hard is when the people you love the most and you trust the most and you give your life to the most emotionally, mentally, spiritually, all of a sudden turn on you and they're going to trash talk you behind your back and spread rumors that aren't true about you and about what you do and your leadership and all these different things. That's when it hurts. And that's when the temptation comes, the enemy says. See, see, like he ne there was never a real relationship. There was, it wouldn't have broken down. If it wasn't, they wouldn't say those things about you. That was never real. Like that was, yeah, it was a, I was all fake. That was all fake. And it's in those moments that the temptation is real. And you can begin to interact with that temptation and believe that, hey, yeah, they, they never really did like me, never really did love me, that was all fake. And actually go into a place where, oh my gosh, I just wasted the last whatever many years of my life or many, you know, many hours of my life investing in this individual all for just for that. But hey, in those moments, you have to choose to not listen to those voices. Because those who told you voices in that moment will wreck your life and cause damage in your life. Because your desire may be pure. I want relationship. I love people. But hey, if that damage gets misguided through temptation, you begin to leave that, listen to that temptation, those voices, there's going to be consequences to that. There's going to be consequences to that. You with me? So where are you? Who told you? Number three, and I'm closing. What have you done? What have you done? Genesis 3, verse 12 to 13. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the, of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. What have you done? Because you see, God wanted to help 
Adam and Eve kind of exit this phase of bondage. Give them a solution, okay? Yeah, I got a plan. Don't worry. This is how loving God is, how gracious God is. God was upset that they didn't listen and they disobeyed. But in that moment, God had a plan. But he wanted, the third stage was, I want to hear you say out of your mouth what you did. I want to hear you say out of your mouth the realities that now you're living because I can't take you to your purpose, to your destination if you don't walk with me through this process. I'm counseling through you this through the, with you through this process. I'm counseling you through the process. I, I want to help you achieve what I've called you to receive. And I remember thinking in that office, called in by that police officer, thinking in my mind, like, man, like what, what? are the consequences what what have I done like why did I do that and there was some other consequences that followed that that were really humbling that were so brutal for me as a grade nine being grade nine however old you are 12 13 so brutal for me the uh, so humbling for me that I never did that specific thing I did a lot of other stupid things after that but I didn't do that specific thing again it like it totally uh, redirected me and I'm thankful for it I'm thankful for it because I could acknowledge, man, this is what it did to my life. This is what I've done. These are the consequences. And now, okay, there must be a solution. And for me, I know that everything began to change for me at that point in that specific area. In that specific area. And I, I thank God for it. But I think it's important that we acknowledge this. And, and it, sometimes there's embarrassing things that we've done. There's things that we've done that we regret. And then there also, I think it's important to acknowledge, even if you're in a good place right now, look at what you've done. Look at the reality that you're living right now. What did, you do to, what did you do to get here? And how can you better steward the blessing of where you're at? Like I said, I want this to apply to both parties here. Those of you that maybe are struggling with an issue and you maybe feel like you're in a mess right now and a blind spot took you out. But I also want to help and encourage others that, hey, if you can acknowledge where you are and you can acknowledge how you got there, who told you, and then you can actually acknowledge what you've done and, and your accomplished and see how God's been in it. He'll take you and promote you to the next phase in your life. God is always asking us these questions in life. Where are you? Who told you? And what have you done? I want you to stand up with me. And I want to give you the, the end result, the finishing moment of this story, the conclusion of this story, which is the introduction for the first time, really, I believe, of, of a picture of the gospel message that, Je that, that Jesus came and preached before Jesus ever came and even preached it in the flesh. Look at it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live, verse 21. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Now you might not think that's significant, but it really is on lots of levels. Because remember, what did Adam and Eve first do when they made that mistake? They, in their own works, tried to figure out a way to cover and hide their condemnation and their shame. They grabbed a fig leaf and they covered their shame. They covered their condemnation. They tried to do it of their own works, their own merit. But then God said, hey, that's not good enough, bro. That's not good enough, Eve. That's not good enough, Adam. I want to help. I want to do it my way. I'm going to give you a picture of grace right now. I'm going to create a sacrifice for you because to get the animal skin that's going to cover you, that's going to protect you, it has to be a sacrifice. So here, these animals are going to be sacrificed on your behalf, and I'm going to protect you and cover you with their skin. That's what Jesus did. He's pictured in the Bible as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the, the, the Lamb who gave His life for us. One sacrifice. One sacrifice for all so then that He would be now our covering. He would be our protection. It's a picture of the gospel. Do you see it here? Do you see it? Interestingly enough, right before Jesus came into Jerusalem in the book of Matthew, what did He do? The very thing that He did was curse the fig leaf. <laughs> get rid of your works. You work to try to figure out how to cover your shame yourself, but hey, I'm doing it a different way. I'm going to cover you. I'm going to be your covering. There is going to be one sacrifice that will be your covering. So as a sign, the fig leaf that Adam and Eve used to cover their condemnation, I'm coming before I die, and I'm saying, I'm cursing that fig leaf. I'm removing condemnation permanently. I'm going to die on the cross, and I'm going to be your covering. And now Romans says they're now is there no, is no longer therefore any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus.